Well, welcome back to the second half of this year's Adblocker Developer Summit. Uh, if you are involved with web technologies, you may have heard about the CSS has selector slash pseudo class. And uh, today at the summit, we have a four person panel that's going to bring us up to date on the most recent developments surrounding it. We're fortunate enough to have Brian Cardell and Byung Woo Lee, both of Igalia, which has done a lot of work in this area. And we'll also hear the perspectives of Shwetang Dixit and Andrea Jamarki, two of my colleagues here at IO. Uh, we'll be getting each of their thoughts individually, uh, starting with Brian Cardell, who is a developer advocate at Igalia. Hi, uh, it's really nice to be here and have the opportunity to talk to you all about has it's one of my favorite subjects. Uh, my name is Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. I am also a member of the CSS working group. And uh, let's hop in the Wayback Machine and imagine a timeline from the very first recommendation of CSS until the present day. Uh, we'll begin with the beginning of CSS. The uh, first recommendation is about 1997. It wasn't very good, it wasn't complete, there weren't really good implementations, but we got to CSS level two really, really early. Uh, you can see on this timeline how quickly. Uh, and that laid down all of the foundational things. And the way that we do this is with a selector that is attached to a rule, it's part of a rule. And the subject is the thing that the rule applies to. And in CSS, the subject is always the last thing. So you can style a code that's inside of a section or an example that's inside of a side note. But very, very quickly, people always ask the question, but how do I style this thing, the thing over on the left? I want to style a section if it contains code or a side note if it contains an example. And the really, really frustrating thing is you cannot. Um, it seems so obvious, right? I mean, the separation of concerns, which CSS is supposed to be about, like really requires you to have the ability to have powerful selectors. So how could the CSS working group miss this seemingly obvious thing? And the thing is, they didn't. Uh, it has been around for kind of forever. Uh, it was in the selectors level three draft in August 1999. And their answer at the time looked like this. Uh, you would just mark the subject with the subject pseudo class. Uh, over the years, there's been lots of like little churns and ideas on this. Uh, one was maybe we should use a character instead of a whole pseudo class. It's more terse. But for most of the history of this feature, it has looked like this. Uh, the has pseudo class that will allow you to style a section if it has an image hero inside it, for example. Now, uh, it is probably surprising to some people to see CSS3 in 1999. That doesn't sound right. If you're kind of cocking your head a little bit in confusion, that's because most of us associate CSS3 with the HTML5 era, which if you look at our timeline, this is like really far along. So what happened to that big missing chunk of time? Uh, well, what happened is what I call the lost years in the W3C. Uh, once the W3C was established, we kind of collectively decided that this web was kind of a good first pancake, but it's not actually very good. Wouldn't it be good to have like a better web, one that could have good answers for applications with like first class things in it? Uh, the W3C kind of decided that HTML is gross, is definitely not for apps, and we're going to invent something else. Uh, and so for a while, everything was a mess. There were two competing style sheet languages, two competing models. Um, two competing selector languages. Uh, and we we're so sure that the browser that had 90% plus share of the market share actually disbanded the browser team. We also kind of weren't very good at it. We were still really learning a lot of things. We didn't have shared test suites. We weren't very good at writing the specs so that they could be implemented interoperably. They weren't very rigorous. Uh, but in the meantime, while all that was playing out, developers did this thing that we do. We built the stuff that they said that this web wasn't for with the tools that we had. Uh, I love this picture. It's in almost all of my talks because uh, I think it's a good metaphor. Um, when houses were originally wired for electricity, uh, there were no outlets because there was nothing to plug in. Houses were wired for the purpose of artificial lighting. But once people had that tool, they went off and invented an entire industry. And that's kind of what we did. Um, 
Debbie three C noticed this and it caused some, you know, debate and some people thought we should rev HTML and there was a workshop and it came to a vote and the vote was largely, no, we don't. Uh, that's where we get the what working group and the beginning of work on HTML five. And that happens right about out here. And this is where some people start to talk about HTML five and CSS three. And it's right about this time when all of these great things are happening out in author space, like the web developer space. And we're at this, you know, paradox time that jQuery comes along. What's really interesting about jQuery in the history of has is that uh, in 2007, it supported has. Uh, the reason that it supported has is because it was in specifications and you need this power. So John Resig went ahead and put it in there. Uh, jQuery, as you might know, became and still is fantabulously successful as a library is very, very widely used. And there was a thought that we could use this to put back into the standards. Uh, this is actually a really good way to pave cow paths maybe. So that began the jQuery standards team, which was originally uh, Yehuda Katz and Paul Irish, then Adi Osmani and later me. Um, and the idea here was uh, to create ways to plug that stuff back into standards. And this is where we got query selector, query selector all, matches, closest. Uh, jQuery also has a has method. We, we don't have that in uh, standards yet, but maybe. <laughs> um, what's really interesting here is that there's a lot of subtleties and this was actually a lot harder than you might think. Uh, because sometimes the cow path that we paved not being a part of standards and CSS will like inevitably sort of disagree. Um, so here are some examples of where that's the case. Um, the way that these things work in jQuery and the way that they work in CSS are not actually the same. Uh, the top one will give you back uh, a list of many things, but in jQuery that would give you back just one. Um, and then what about this? Uh, jQuery allowed you to begin a selector with a combinator because you could provide a context element. In CSS, uh, we tried to say that selectors should mean the same thing all the time, but there's no way in CSS to write a selector that begins with a combinator. So uh, that is really, really hard. Um, this is part of what we have and it's maybe related, but it's maybe not because the thing inside of the pseudo class doesn't have to be writable necessarily outside this selector. Uh, but this, this is a thing that is, you know, shapes some of the conversations. Um, inevitably in standards, there are a lot of compromises to finally reach a standard. And one of the things that came up in all these discussions that seemed like a good compromise at the time was this idea of scope, which is a pseudo class that would allow us to write lots of the things that you couldn't write, um, by just giving it some phony idea of a scope. And in CSS, that would just mean the document. Uh, so that seemed good. Um. I will just, that's all I'll say about this because it will come back later on uh, in another portion of this talk, but uh, whatever happened to has, right? Uh, 2011, where we just left off in the timeline to now is still a really long time. Like, why do we not have it? Uh, it was in selectors level three uh, until suddenly it wasn't. Uh, and then it was in selectors level four until suddenly it wasn't. And there was even recently, uh, not so long ago, Discussion about whether we should move it to selectors level five. Uh, the use cases for has come up a lot. Uh, frequently it's brought up because people want just one part of the power. Uh, so why doesn't it get done? I mean, if jQuery could do it in 2007, what, what is the holdup? It is very, very, very frustrating to so many developers. Uh, like, why can you not do this? Uh, the answer is, it's complicated. Uh, in JavaScript, we're asking to evaluate one selector at a very set point in time on a particular context. And this is not that hard. That's why you can implement it in jQuery or wherever. Uh, and also there are other things like Prince XML that uh, process the document sort of one time. And it actually has a lot more w in common with the way JavaScript works. Uh, 
that also supports has. But in a browser, rule matching and application are live, even as the document is being built, and it all needs to work at 60 frames per second. Uh, computationally, this is very, very complex, even with the CSS selector power we have today. And over the years, we're really only even able to do it with the powers we have today because we've figured out how to do it very efficiently. And almost all of those very efficient, smart things that we do are based on this invariant directionality of the rule where the subject is the last thing and has kind of breaks that. So we have to find a way around that. Uh, one seemingly obvious solution to this is to let it work in JavaScript, but not elsewhere. Uh, because it also works in print where you have this idea of static processing, there was an idea that maybe we could define a static profile. Um, but most of the working group is against this because we would like to avoid fragmenting CSS. Uh, but can we? Uh, this is a circular discussion, actually. This is like the old Abbott and Costello routine, who's on first? It just goes around and round in circles. And this is very, very, very frustrating. Uh, how do we get out of this loop? Uh, and why are we in it in the first place? And I realize that this is very frustrating, so let me explain that there are some fairly mundane reasons for this. Uh, one is that spec development is kind of like other software in a lot of ways. It's really, really hard to estimate. Uh, you have to ship a product, right? So when we begin a spec, it has lots of features in it. And you have to prioritize the work, and then at some point you might have to drop something or postpone it. And usually, very often, it's the really big and complex ones. And this winds up being exacerbated because uh, it's not much of a choice when the complexity of has means we don't even know how to like how to estimate it. Uh, it requires R and D of some of your best people for a potentially long period of time just to know how to size up the question. And on a normal product, you might find a way to catch up, but standards are kind of like this. There's conveyor belt of more and more and more and more and more. So getting to those big, long, hard problems on the conveyor belt is really, really hard. Uh, so this is tragic because if it doesn't get implemented priority from three vendors, it just doesn't move forward. And there is historically no way to get them to do anything with it. So that sucks, and it, it doesn't have to be that way is kind of the good news. Uh, at Egalia, we talk about this all the time. We have a podcast that's here. Uh, but at Egalia, we love open and we love hard problems. We've helped to do a lot of great things like uh, CSS Grid and JavaScript classes were funded by Bloomberg Tech. Uh, we've helped advance MathML while it's been stuck for a really long time through funding various sources, including Egalia's own investment. Uh, We've worked on uh, hardware accelerated SVG and Canvas in workers, uh, and that's paid for by cable boxes and cooking machines. Uh, that's really interesting. We can bring more priorities to the table. We can bring more points of view. But what's really important in this is that anytime we do that, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. And so uh, that's where we're really grateful to have this partnership with IO, who approached us and said, you know, has this separation of concerns is like paramount for like ad blockers and plugins because they literally cannot control the source. There's no workarounds really. Uh, so let's figure this out and see if we can move out of this loop. Uh, so that's what we've been doing uh, this year. We've been uh, giving a hard problem the priority that it deserves to get out of this loop. That's involved a lot of discussions internally and exploration, some early prototyping in Chromium. We wrote a lot of tests to figure out performance and all kinds of things. We did a lot of tweaking as we got data for those that was uh, maybe a little concerning. Uh, we created an explainer with all of this. Uh, that's led to more discussions and finally, uh, some intents in Chromium. And since then, actually some more discussions. So uh, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague who is gonna talk about the implementation challenges and the progress that we've made on this so far. Thanks. Well, like Brian just mentioned, next up is uh, Bjorn Wuli, who is a developer at Digalia. I'm going to share about the HES prototyping progress. 
I'm b y o n g u l i a software engineer at Igalia. I will start this presentation from the health functionality that everyone may already know. And I will simply explain the problems of health and possible approaches for those. And after that, I will share the prototyping progress. It includes what have done so far and what are the remainings and what are the roughly expected schedules. The HES functionality can be described using the four directions that um, exist in the relationship between two elements of a tree structure. So an element can be a parent or an ancestor of another element, and an element can be a previous sibling of another element, and it can be a child or descendant of another element, and also it can be a, a next sibling of another element. So these are the four directions, and by combining these directions, we can describe all the relationships between elements in a tree structure. And as you already know, CSS Combinators provides only two of the four directions. So it provides a child or descendant relationship like this, and it provides a next sibling relationship like this. But it doesn't provide the other two directions. But the, the main reason of the limitation is that it is efficient for performance optimization. Checking the descendant relationship is more efficient than checking the ancestor relationship because uh, an element only have one par parent, but it can have multiple children. And by removing one of the two opposite directions, we can uh, we can place the subject of a selector to its right. From this, we can get some advantages of having simpler design and logic for selector-related operations. Each browser engine has its own designs and optimizations for the performance-critical operations like selector matching or style invalidation, and those are based on this limitation. Uh, in this context, Hesud class tries to provide the other two directions. So it tries to uh, provide a parent or ancestor relationship like this, and it also provides a previous sibling relationship like this. Mm. When we have a condition of a reference element, we have been able to use the download, only the download of the reference element with the CSS combinators. But uh, with has uh, theoretically, we can use all the elements around the reference element. So with has, we can match with all relationships like this, and we can select all relationships like this. And also we can style all the relationships like this. But to use has, we need to solve many problems. And as you already, as I already told, has selector matching is basically heavy operation because, because it needs to check or uh, the descendant of a subject element instead of its ancestors. So as you can see here, matching this selector that checks an ancestor relationship of this subject element needs more matching operations than matching this selector that checks the descendant relationship of this subject element. So in this case, has matching is O N operation where N is the number of the descendant element of this subject element. And in some case, has matching performance becomes worse. If there are multiple subject elements that share same, the share same downward subtree, there can be duplicated has argument matching operations on the downward subtree. 
Because of this repetitive argument matching overhead, in worst case, it can be O and square operation. And we also have many problems in hash style invalidation. Uh, when we have any mutation on a DOM tree, the browser engine tries to find elements that can be affected by the, the change and invalidate the style of those elements. So far, due to the limitations on the combinators, uh, the elements to be invalidated are always the changed element itself or in its downward subtree. Uh, based on this limitation, the engine has long been designed and highly optimized uh, the style invalidation steps. And has also breaks this limitation. When we have a style rule that using has and when we have any mutation that affect the has state, then we need to find the possibly affected element from the upward of the changed element instead of its downward. Uh, due to this difference, the has invalidation cannot simply integrate it with the existing invalidation designs and optimizations. And we can easily make complex invalidation case. So as you can see here, when we use ease in has and when we have any mutation that affect the ease state, uh, we need to traverse downward first to find the element that possibly affected by the ease condition. And then we need to traverse upward again to find the element to be invalidated. The worst thing here is that um, each browser engine has its own designs and optimizations for uh, the invalidation process. So it is difficult to get a single general solution for, the, for all browser engines. Okay, so there are so many problems in HES and it is too difficult to consider those all at once. And there might be many more unknown problems. So we decided to break the large and complex problems down into smaller problems and try to get feasible solutions for each problems and find a way of, way of combining or extending the solutions. So instead of finding a general solution for all browser engines from the beginning, we focused to the Chromium engine to clarify some other problems and solutions for those, hoping that it will help finding general solutions or ideas for those. And we separated problems into two categories for CSS profiles. So the problems related with has selector matching are were categorized uh, problems in snapshot profile. And the problems related with the has style invalidation were categorized the problems in, in live profile. And we tried to find possible solutions for each problems independently. So like this, uh, we had investigated the problems and its solutions and tested, uh, tested functionalities and performance of those, those solutions and wrote some document to share about those. And based on this, uh, we started the prototyping in the Chromium project. So you can find the related information from these links. For about the has in snapshot profile, uh, we have landed some patches so far. So um, in the snapshot profile, 
the head supports almost all cases except some shadow boundary crossing cases. So you can you can try most head cases with JavaScript APIs like query selector, query selector all matches and closest. Hmm. For the O and square problem, uh, we were able to remove the repetitive argument matching overhead uh, by caching has matching status within a life cycle. Mm, but still we need to we need more investigation for these problems. Mm. For about the O and argument matching overhead, we may think about an approach of uh, changing cache lifetime later. And we also propose the change of relative selector spec. So you can get some details in this link. <clears throat> Since the Chromium version 95, the has in snapshot profile is under uh, the experimental runtime flag that names uh, enable experimental web platform features. So by enabling this flag, uh, you can you can try has with uh, JavaScript APIs, and uh, you can also enable this by passing a command line flag like this. And currently, we are doing the prototyping of has style invalidation. These are related with very complex and performance critical steps, and there are many, many kinds of variations. So uh, first, we checked some complexity or performance impact of some variations like this. And after that, we tried to clarify the possible limitations that it can take uh, to balance the coverage and complexity or coverage and performance impact. <clears throat> and we also try to define the steps to check those limitations. So uh, you can get uh, the details in these links. And based on this, uh, we are trying to we are trying to start the initial implementation of has invalidation. Actually, uh, since the Chromium from version 95, uh, you can try has in live profile also by passing the command line uh, flag CSS sudo has like this. Mm, with this flag, you can style an element uh, with has. Uh, but this version doesn't support style invalidation for the style rules with has. So you can you can see that has is working only on loading time. And what currently we are doing is about the has style invalidation. So when we have any progress on this, um, we can see that the parent parent style is changed uh, according to its descendant condition. We have roughly scheduled plans like this. So we are planning to support has invalidation with the maximum limitation, hopefully, hopefully at the end of this year. Uh, this initial step will only support has at a terminal and top level compound selector. And it will only provide um, child, has child, and has descendant functionality. And it will only allow one compound selector as its argument, and there will be only uh, attribute and elemental selectors in the argument compound selector. Mm. After we finish this, we are going to try following uh, one by one. And those are flexible for now. Hey, this is all about the has prototyping progress so far. Uh, thank you for listening. 
Continuing the discussion next is Shwetan Dixit, who is VP of Core Technology here at IO. Hi, I'm Shwetan. I'm VP of Core Tech at IO. As you might know that I'm also one of the moderators for, for this event, but in this talk, I'm also one of the speakers. And you've heard from Brian and Wang Wu on the has story, the, the background, a little bit more on the implementation part. I'm here to talk a little bit about why it's relevant to ad filtering, right? So let's go. Um, why is this interesting to the ad filtering use case? Ad filtering requires going into the page and selecting things out properly to, to actually filter out, right? Um, and having powerful selectors is really, really beneficial when it comes to this, you know, having powerful and flexible selectors that you can use in multiple use cases is really important for the ad filtering use case. And that's why has is important. Um, it's, it's quite interesting because it's quite powerful and flexible. Unfortunately, till now, it's not implemented in browsers. And because of which we do have some workarounds in, in JavaScript that we use in our extensions, but it's not ideal. It would be really great if this is provided natively by the browser as part of CSS. And this is the basis of our, of our interest over here. Now, when we posed this problem to Igalia, we were talking to them about various things that, that would be beneficial to the web, especially when it came, comes to ad filtering. We talked about this as well. It was quite intriguing to both of us. They mentioned that it's been discussed in the past um, by, by various people. Um, and the consensus um, all the time in the past was that there are some pro performance concerns and because of which, you know, it never really, you know, uh, took off. We said maybe things have changed now, you know, since the last time this was discussed, um, you know, and, and seriously someone took a look, since the last time that happened, devices have increased in performance. You know, browser performance has also improved. Maybe there's also a fresh new way in which you can take a look at actually implementing this, which could actually uh, address some of these performance concerns as well. And this is what Igalia took a look at and developed a very promising approach. So we're, we're really, really excited about this. Now to go a little bit more deeper into uh, some of the technical areas of, of how this would affect ad filtering, I'll pass, it, pass this on to, to Andrea. As Shwetong just mentioned, to round out the conversation, we now have Andrea Jamarki, who is a developer at IO. Hello. Thank you, Paul. Um, let me share my screen first. And uh, hopefully everything is fine. Uh, so we have seen so far the story uh, or the, the journey uh, uh, from uh, uh, Igalia, the implementers, all the challenges and everything. And Shwetank already mentioned what exactly is that uh, uh, has is solving for, for us in, in terms of filtering and, and ad blocking. And so for me, that I've always advocated somehow web standards, it, it has been an incredible journey because I, I, I was close to the whole process that has been described. So uh, all, all the, ca the, the prioritizing, all the uh, creating uh, some sort of uh, um, demos or examples, testing, all this kind of stuff. And I, I've done uh, probably nothing compared to what Igalia has done, but he's been cool regardless. And like every love story, because I love also the feature itself, uh, it starts with uh, once upon a time. And uh, that's something that, uh, it has been mentioned already. It was jQuery. It was 14 years ago. So that's why uh, most developers maybe... Andrea, just very quickly, uh, it looks like your screen has gone black. If you could just reshare it for us very quickly so we can see what you're looking at too. Uh, that's very unfortunate. I hope this is fine now. Can you see now? Looks great, thank you so much. I'm so sorry about that. Anyway, uh, it was just the second slide. So the first one was about the journey and the story is the fact that for me has been a love story. And uh, the fact that uh, it's been 14 years that I've been waiting for this to uh, to happen. And uh, the um, we already mentioned that jQuery was uh, uh, literally an inspiration for a lot of 
modern standards and uh, and that's been great but uh, uh, we also need to understand how uh, powerful can be this has selector in this case brian already mentioned uh, the section with the container but uh, in this case uh, maybe it's not a hero maybe it's a card and the most exciting part for me is the fact that now we can um, uh, also have transitions within the same container accordingly to whatever they contain so it's a new way of styling the the the, the, the outer component with the inner components knowledge that has never been seen before, except with through JavaScript hackery around. And so this feature is so cool that when I see this page, uh, every time I go there, <laughs> I see uh, red crosses all over, uh, a lot of boxes with no, no, no. And I try to uh, click expand the boxes and it shows a bigger no uh, with an issue that if you click the issue, it goes to the issue where a lot of people are discussing and the result is still a lot of no. So. This is uh, infuriating because you, you would expect after 14 years, maybe something happened. Um, but yes, it's been complicated. Let's talk about why it's so uh, interesting. Uh, Shwetank has been very, mm, let's say, mild in saying some, some JavaScript around. But the thing is that uh, most ads are part of the, are sneakily part of the, what looks like exactly the same content. So are not super easy to recognize. And uh, because they use the same container, they're all inside the same container. An ad is not just an image, it's not just an e a video, uh, it's not just the text. It's the whole thing that looks exactly like everything else. So you barely notice when you see ads. And the fact that uh, we, we cannot stop the selector within these containers means that we need to use mutation observer, we need to use caching validation. And if you if you uh, uh, listen to the, the, the little nightmare that Igalia went through to, uh, to, to find all the possible solutions, well, basically, if they, if they can do that uh, with, the, uh, with the native uh, performance, uh, imagine we are doing that through JavaScript, uh, and that's not ideal at all. So um, this is great for us because we can have better performance for, for, for our users, but it's also great for the web in general. And if there is one thing I've always said is that uh, whenever there is a native API or a native solution, especially when it's CSS can, that can fix the problem or can address the problem and solve it, uh, just go native, never, never try to reinvent the wheel with JavaScript because um, it makes no sense. It's just more code, it makes surely the experience is slightly, uh, either slightly or very slower. Um, and also it's great for web developers because the deemable containers are something new. Um, I, hopefully we're not expecting new frameworks out of this selector, but uh, every existing framework can actually benefit from, from this new opportunity that wasn't possible before just through the CSS. So we have lost code, lighter pages, also the, the, the layout, the HTML layout can be uh, slightly simplified because we don't need a composition of multiple classes in the outer component and the inner component to understand how everything should look. So it should simplify in general. And so this is great. And uh, it, like Shwetank already mentioned, and uh, it's great because it's the right time. It's been super complex to, to, to understand all the things. It's super complex to solve as an issue. We don't know yet how far the, 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 the final implementation will, will work as expected, but so far the, the progress is great. Uh, browsers are way more powerful these days. Even feature phones can, can have a quite powerful and a smooth experience online. So the, the hardware is there and this new approach, this, this, all this experimentation that Igalia uh, did, um, it looked super, super promising. Um, it's not just me being excited about this. I think it's pretty much everyone <laughs> in the field. So as soon as few flags, uh, like has been shown, the flag to launch the browser with uh, with experimental version, a few articles came up and, and people in the field were super, super excited and super happy. The only side effect of being excited about a technology that is not there, even if it has been around virtually for 14 years, thanks to jQuery, is that sometimes you need um, to be careful with the implementation. 
For instance, in our case, we had a conversation with our fellow the blockers because maybe uh, we we decide to use a, um, a specialized prefix for for features for element hiding features that we are not confident will be exactly uh, like the standard meant. Um, but maybe other products they decide to um, to just be more user friendly and just propose what everyone expect from has selector uh, uh, to, to do. And so the good thing is that we discussed uh, the, the current work in progress. We discussed all the limitations that we know so far and all the things that we might be careful about. And the great thing is that we had this conversation is that we are converging toward um, a unified syntax for the has selector that works uh, let's say universally for all uh, ad blockers. So we don't need to duplicate filters because we use some prefix, somebody doesn't, somebody has to convert our prefix and vice versa. So we don't want to create this kind of issue for friction for filters authors. So that's why basically everyone win. And indeed, we are already aligned across uh, products. At, at least we know that uh, it's coming, it's coming natively. We can use it and we don't need uh, to do too much uh, JavaScript hackery around, uh, especially for, at least for now, for more simple selectors, but there are already few selectors used uh, here and there in the filters, uh, in, in the, uh, yeah, in the blocking filters industry. So that's uh, awesome. And I hope uh, everyone else is uh, excited as I am. And thanks again for uh, uh, listening to this talk. Um, and I think we have time for some questions now. Yeah, thanks, uh, Andrea, and everybody else uh, who just spoke on the panel. We have had a few questions come in across uh, our channels, and we should have time for a couple of them. Uh, one of the, this has obviously been on people's radar for, for quite some time. During uh, Andrea's talk, he shared some social media feedback that he saw. Um, well, I'm wondering if you guys can share any other anecdotes, any stories, about the excitement uh, that these new developments have generated amongst uh, developers. Well, I can tell you that uh, even many members of the CSS working group have, were pretty excited to see some of this uh, because, uh, <clears throat> so for example, in 1999, that first draft that I showed with the subject selector, that was uh, Danielle Glasman introduced that. Um, and he has been waiting for this for a really long time. When he saw that article, he uh, was very excited about it which I, I think is pretty cool. Yeah, I, I remember, Brian, when you tweeted uh, this for the first time and it sort of blew up. And I just tried to take a look at the quote tweets uh, of, of, of people, you know, try to see what's uh, what, what the feedback is over there. And th there was literally no one that I could see who had any sort of um, non-excited take on it. Everyone was sort of really, really excited about the fact that it, we are even considering the fact that, okay, we can have has now in uh, in, in browsers. The, the thought of it is is quite exciting. So um, that's, that's a small anecdote that I wanted to, to share, just taking a look at Brian's tweet back in the day, like a, a couple of months ago, and just seeing what people are quoting on top of this, and everyone was just super excited. Yeah, if I can add anything, um, a few weeks ago or months, uh, I would say, uh, I, I tried to convince everyone that XPath <laughs> 2 or more should, should land in the browser. And one of the main reasons was because uh, the self or ancestor uh, selector was super powerful for what I was trying to do, but I didn't want to uh, uh, to force uh, everyone to, to use this XPath selector instead of just CSS, because with CSS is much uh, easier, nicer, and, and 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 simpler to reason about, and so for me it was uh, this was the uh, another background story was about I really wanted this kind of selector, and this is it's, it's awesome that the community was so positive about this. Great, we have another question that's uh, that's come in. It's a bit of a broader question, uh, but somebody's wondering what kind of impact could has have on web design moving forward. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think Andrea covered some good examples, but one I think is what I said, just that CSS promises a separation of concerns, like the whole model is based on being able to apply your styles uh, without going and mucking with your markup. 
and to the truth is that you can't really do that for a lot of things because you don't have the powers that you need and has is one of the core powers that you need so i think that will have a really really big impact yeah regarding like things like design systems um i like i do think it's gonna have some impact I, i'm sort of like curious and sort of I actually don't know how much of an impact it is going to have, but it's going to be certainly interesting to see how it, it impacts design systems in general for, for people working on those things. Yeah, let's get to a couple that we've actually just had come into uh, the chat right now. Um, uh, first one uh, from Elisa again. Um, what can people do right now to see has in action right now. I think Byung Wu shared some links earlier during his presentation. Is there anywhere else that we could see it in action? Yes, yeah, so uh, since the Chrome version 95, uh, you can use has uh, by enabling the experimental uh, flag. So uh, you can call um, the uh, selector with has uh, so uh, you can use the JavaScript APIs like uh, query selector, query selector, uh, like the like that. And uh, after enabling uh, the has in snap uh, live profile, you can see that uh, the has is working uh, on in the uh, styler. So you can you can test that, but but no. Uh, as I shared already shared, uh, has invalidation is not supported yet, and I'm currently uh, trying to uh, do that. So when we have any progress, you can uh, you can see that the style with has can be uh, changed by some mutations. So you can you can test it with that. Great. We've got one more question that's coming from uh, Andrei Meshkov. Um, the question is, are there any plans to add any other pseudo classes available in content blockers right now? Uh, for example, that contains pseudo class. Uh, maybe I can comment that. Uh, we haven't discussed it yet in details. One, one, one pseudo class per time, I would say. Um, but um, if you... If, I, th I think what we what we do with contains is more addressing the text, and so far CSS doesn't really cannot really address the text. So it can address attributes, it can address uh, tags, it can address um, siblings, but not specifically address the text. And so that's something that uh, um, we, we we need to figure out how is that possible or how, or how that could even work. If it was for me, I would. I would just propose, hey, let's put regular expression in CSS, but I think it's going to be a, 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 a nightmare in terms of performance. And, and so we need to be careful with whatever proposal in the future uh, there will be. But contains is surely on, on our radar as well. Great. Well, Brian, Youngwoo, Shwetan, Gandhara, thanks so much for participating in this discussion and for making some time for us today. Uh, it's been really fascinating for all of us. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.